we have a, bat, a backup uh, hitter uh, next. Or already clear. Sorry. Every round. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you, John, for organizing this. Um, a, a caveat before I begin. Uh, while I think I know a fair amount about Soviet espionage in America and how the FBI dealt with it, I'm far from an expert on Great Britain and, and the major players in British counterintelligence and, more importantly, the bureaucratic structures and intrigues of MI5, um, which I think have to be considered when you consider this case. Now, over the years, I I'd read a, a, most of the vast literature on the British spies for the Soviet Union with fascination and puzzlement. Uh, the Cambridge spies, in particular, have generated, obviously, an enormous literature, uh, befitting their importance, their improbable recruitment, and the massive incompetence of British counterintelligence agencies that ignored clues, turned a blind eye to glaring issues in their background. I mean, you know, MI6 knew that Philby was married to a communist. Um, and apparently it never bothered them. Um, excused personal improprieties uh, and avoided searching inquiries into intelligence failures. Um, when, I, when I first became aware of the Hollis case, um, I, I, I dismissed it, quite frankly, uh, partly because uh, Peter Wright uh, and Spycatcher did not inspire a great deal of confidence. Um, and I, I was very skeptical about the charges on Hollis. Um, it, it seemed to me that, that uh, a good deal of it was attributing everything to a conspiratorial mindset. Uh, I, I, we, that's one of the dangers, of course, of, of uh, getting involved in, in the wilderness of mirrors, that you can find a hidden hand behind every action. And sometimes it becomes very easy to uh, forget about the fact that individuals and organizations can make honest mistakes. Um, they can also be incompetent. And intelligence failures uh, are not necessarily due to the machinations of moles. Um, certainly in, in my studies on uh, American espionage, um, the, the KGB screwed up a great deal. The FBI often screwed up. Um, the, the people that were doing the spying often screwed up. Um, you know, you, you, you get these descriptions of what spycraft or tradecraft is supposed to be like, and then you would read uh, details of actual spy cases, and these guys are violating every possible uh, rule. You know, agents having affairs with their handlers. Um, people make mistakes. Uh, people are human, even spies. Um, and organizations are often loath to admit to mistakes. Uh, they cover up, they deny, they obfuscate, um, they don't want to look bad. So, that, that all cause for skepticism about the fact that, that intelligence failures are attributable to spies or moles. Um, and I read Chapman Pincher's Treachery and Paul Monk's detailed case. Uh, I must say that, that uh, Chapman Pincher makes one feel really inadequate to realize that he wrote this book when he was almost 100 years old. Um, <laughs> You know, that, that's very, very depressing. Um, reading, reading that book and um, Paul Monk's uh, arguments uh, has moved me, I would say, from the ranks of the skeptical to the ranks of the partially convinced, uh, but only partially. Uh, there, there, par there are portions of the argument that uh, both Pincher and Monk lay out that still strike me as too speculative or too reliant on third-hand hearsay. Um, there is, as yet, no smoking gun. There is no document from the Russian archives that can clinch the case. 
Um, and, and finally, I, I should add one other caveat. Um, I, I'm, maybe I'm unique on this panel, uh, what, except for uh, Charles. Sorry, thank you. Um, and then I'm an academic. And one of the disconcerting things about Chapman Pincher's book is there are no footnotes. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's an occupational hazard. I want footnotes. I want to see the sources for the assertions. A lot of the assertions are plausible, but you want to see exactly what they're based on. Uh, just one example that occurs to me, uh, the story about, um, about Hollis meeting uh, the, the uh, GRU operative viewer in, in Beijing. And it's based on an interview with somebody that roomed in Beijing with Hollis. Well, it's plausible, but I'd like to see you know, who did the interview, what's the details, what were the circumstances of the interview, how old was the man being interviewed, how good was his memory. Um, these are the kinds of things that you would want. Now, again, I'm not saying that after you did that, you would conclude that Pincher was wrong. But as an academic, I want to see the footnotes. Um, one thing I think is clear, I, I have enormous respect for Chris Andrew and his work, uh, but I think that for whatever reason, uh, he dismissed the case against Hollis far too cavalierly in Defend the Realm. Uh, and that dismissal is no minor matter, as Paul Monk argues. Um, a, a few words about the evidence about Sonia and, and Hollis. Um, Parts of the case about the relationship between them that Paul Monk lays out strike me as very compelling. Uh, a few seem nothing more than speculation, as Paul himself acknowledges. Um, again, a caveat. The, the, const the description of Sonia as a super agent and the assertions about her importance may well be true. But again, I think we have to be cautious. Uh, I have no doubt that her memoir was carefully vetted by Soviet intelligence. And they had been known, believe it or not, to toss out misinformation and disinformation. Um, I mean, we, we don't accept what Kim Philby said in his autobiography, right? Um, because the Soviets had a reason for publishing that autobiography or having it published. By the same token, a great deal of what Sonia says may be accurate. We don't know. Um, likewise, um, just from the American case, um, well, posthumous awards from Vladimir Putin, who, who awarded Sonia a posthumous medal, may or may not be significant. Uh, I remember when um, George Covell, who some of you will recall, uh, an American, uh, Putin awarded him posthumously a medal, uh, talked about him about being a major GRU atomic spy. Well, the evidence seems to indicate that Covell was, but not terribly important, or at least as far as we know. So, Sonia may be overrated, or her exploits exaggerated. We don't know. Um, secondly, while it's plausible that Sonia met Hollis in China, uh, there's no hard evidence. Uh, just because they shared a friendship with Agnes Smedley is suggestive, but I don't think it's dispositive. Um, and, and Paul says that there's no mention of Hollis in the Shanghai police files. Now, it's possible that there's a, a reason for that, uh, but again, we know that the Shanghai police were quite thorough in their investigations of communists. Hollis isn't there. Um, again, the, her, her being at Oxford when Hollis and MI5 were nearby, um, it's interesting, it's circumstantial, it suggests there may have been a relationship, it's tantalizing, but it's not conclusive. Uh, we just don't know. Um, more significant to me, and the, the questions that I, I would like to see further explored, um, is the argument that Hollis protected both Fuchs and Sonia. Um, he cleared Fuchs several times, um, and, and Pincher argues that he knew about Fuchs's communist 
past. Um, the question is, did he know about his communist present? How much did Hollis know about Fuchs? Um, it is stunning that an MI5 report from 1949 that Tencher quotes states that Fuchs was cleared in 1943, quote, on the basis that he would be of less danger to security on the other side of the Atlantic, end quote. Um, that's an indictment that even if Hollis was not a spy, he would have gotten fired um, long before he rose to be the assistant and then the director general of MI5. Um, and the other puzzle that I think is worthy of further investigation is Hollis's reluctance to investigate or ramp up pressure on Sonia. Um, again, I, I think we would need to explore more thoroughly the question about uh, exactly how much influence Hollis had on that decision. Um, was there no one else in MI5 that questioned that decision, especially due to Sonia's connection to other spies that MI5 knew about in her family, um, and the fact that Alexander Foote, um, a, a, a defector, had specifically named her. Uh, and then the other question, why did Dick White um, go along with Hollis's lies and incompetence? Um, no one suggests that White was a mole. Uh, was it simply loyalty to an old friend? Um, was White utterly clueless about what Hollis was doing when Hollis was his subordinate? Um, these are all questions I think that need to be answered um, and it's going to take somebody that obviously can get access to MI5 files and some of these things, uh, but also uh, an understanding of the relationships within MI5, the hierarchy of MI5. Um, Ray can certainly speak far better than I can to, the, to this question with, with the FBI, um, but it strikes me that if, if somebody in a position of authority at the FBI, uh, comparable to what Hollis was doing in the 1940s, had just blown away suggestions that based on some evidence that certain individuals were Soviet spies, some of their subordinates or some of their superiors would have raised questions. Were questions raised within MI5? Um, th there's no argument that MI5 was totally honeycombed with Soviet moles. So was it incompetence? Uh, a refuse, a, a fear that, that delving too deeply in this would embarrass the agency? And then, once things blew up, that everybody colluded in a kind of um, cover-up. So those are the kinds of questions I have. Thank you.